leading teams uh, both in college and in the NFL. Uh, he recently left his position as the head coach of the University of Nevada to come here and take over uh, the Colorado State Rams. So without further ado, uh, please give a loud round of applause for Coach James. Never met a man that was so invested in his organization 
and learn so much about wanting a program from him. Um, then I went to uh, the University of Nebraska with, with uh, Tim Cassidy, uh, who's my chief of staff. It's here once, just way Tim. Tim's here. Um, was at the University of Nebraska and uh, was with, with Bill Callahan. Was with Bill Callahan with the Raiders. Um, uh, learned an awful lot, obviously being with Bill for many years. Um, was an offensive coordinator there. You know, I started taking on more responsibility as a coordinator. Um, was there for three wonderful years. UCLA as an offensive coordinator. Uh, got a chance to be in a much different environment. Los Angeles, a lot of media, a lot of attention, big city. That was a great experience for me as well. Uh, went from UCLA to Oklahoma. Oklahoma is one of the, the most proud programs in athletics uh, in, in the country. You know, uh, year in, year out, it's a top five program. Seven years with Bob Stoops, who uh, is another Hall of Fame coach. Seven years with Joe Castiglione, who is looked upon as the godfather of, of athletic administrators. Um, and and uh, President Bourne, um, who is an amazing leader of the university. So I was there, I was a co-coordinator there. Spent a year after that, went to Texas. I uh, was, was there with Charlie Strong for a year. Went to Arizona State with Todd Graham, was there for a year. And then I spent the last five years at the University of Nevada as a head coach. I became a head coach relatively late in my career. I was a career assistant. I've been a coordinator at some of the biggest schools in the country. Gained a lot of experience. But I took from all of those leaders and I poured it all into my opportunity to lead a program at Nevada. Um, and so really proud of what we accomplished there. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, I was there for five years. We had four winning seasons, four bowl games. We got a winning record in our bowl games. And this is just a, a, a couple of pictures here along the way. I was, I was asked to write a book about wide receiver play. I, I, I had many All-Americans in college when I was at uh, Oklahoma at wide receivers. And I coached uh, Reggie Wayne, who was, who's, who's out of the picture of this book here, and Martin Harrison. Martin Harrison just went to the Hall of Fame. And so I was approached by Human Kinetics, and they, they said, you know, Jay, we want somebody to write a book about receiver play, and you have such fabulous experience in college coaching all these All-Americans. At the time, Ryan Broyles had, had broken the, the record for receiving in college football, more receptions than any player ever in college football. And then you coach these Hall of Fame uh, players in professional football. And you know, when you're coaching, you're, you're, it's an all-consuming thing. And, uh, I told my wife, I, I never forget, I, I went home and told my wife, I said, I don't have time to write a book. I said, I think I, I can write a book. And she looked at me and she goes, when is anybody ever going to ask you to write a book? And I said, you know, you're right. And so I, I used to get up at like 4 o'clock in the morning and I'd write for like two hours for months. And uh, I really believe everybody's got a book in them. And it's best decision I ever made to do it. It took me about two years. You, you know, you go through the outline, you write your chapters, you have an idea what you want it to look like, then you go back and detail it, and then, you know, to finalize it, you know, they wanted us to do pictures and things. So, you know, I'm supposed to say that I'm an author when I when I speak to people, and so I wanted to make sure I covered that. So I have, I have, I have written a book. Um, and then I thought this picture was important. This is my ring box. And so um, when I talk to recruits, I show them this because this is, this is kind of all the wonderful things that I've gotten a chance to do. And uh, all the different bowl games, I think, I, I think it's 23 bowl games 
that I've been to. Uh, so I have all the rings and the championship rings and watches. Uh, these down here, the watches start when I was in school at Iowa, and they go all the way through. And you can see as they, as you, as you go up with these watches, they get bigger and bigger. Um, but I, I, I say that because I, I've coached in national championship games when I was at Oklahoma. I coached in the Super Bowl for the Oakland Raiders, and um, I coached in every BCS Bowl game. So there were five major BCS Bowl games, the Orange Bowl, the Sugar Bowl, the, the uh, Fiesta Bowl, um, the Cotton Bowl, what's the other one? Beach. Beach. Rose Bowl. Rose Bowl, yeah. So I, and I've actually got several Rose Bowl watches up there. So I got a chance to, to coach in some pretty big games. And so I take all that experience and, and I'm here at Fort Collins. And I, and, and I, and I say that because when you talk about leadership, I can't really speak about the things that I believe in leadership without really honoring the people that I work for. So that's really important to me. And uh, this ring box kind of tells, tells my history. Um, you know, just as far as my business, my business is football. And, you know, I told, I told, uh, we have a leadership committee and I'll talk about that. Um, but, but my job is to lead a large organization. We have 114 student athletes. We have close to 200 people. Um, the staff numbers are immense. And so it's a big, big, big organization. You know, we have 10 assistant coaches, four graduate assistants, three analysts, six administrative staff, our recruiting staff, our video staff, our trainers, strength coaches, equipment managers, um, academic advisors, student managers. It's my job to get everybody on one page and have everybody know what we're trying to accomplish and how we're going to do it. And I have to paint a picture that everybody can see clearly. That's really, really important. And, you know, we have several pictures. This is uh, our house over here at Easter. My wife always tries to feed as many people as she can on every holiday. And, uh, but these are people that, they're my family. Um, it's really important that you understand that as a leader. You know, we have team pictures, and I look at the team picture. And I'm responsible for all those people, their families, their wives, their kids, everybody that's associated with the program. I'm responsible for them. So I take that very seriously. I'm going to talk about this. This is daily routine. And this is fresh on my mind because um, the Denver Post followed me around and uh, last week. And uh, they wanted to see you know, what my daily routine was. And I think it's important as a leader you think about that. Because everything you do the rest of the day is affected by your mindset. And so my daily routine is for my mental health and for my mindset. It sets me up for the day. Okay, so this is just what I do. This is an example. And everybody has to have their, you know, I wake up early. You know, I, I'm Catholic, I do the rosary every day, I say the prayer of St. Michael every day, and Psalms 91, all for protection, okay? Uh, pray for my family, pray for my friends, pray, I pray for people out loud every single day. I exercise, it changes, it's been a lot of things over the years, um, it's not quite what it used to be, but I do exercise, I think it's good to get your body going in the morning and really just kind of kind of decompress and get ready for the day. Um, I listen to a lot of books. I, I used to read for 30 minutes and my day got compressed, but I will either read or listen to an audio book every single day. And it's amazing, you know, if you're in the car, you can listen to an audio book and, and uh, one of the books that I read 
uh, talked about that, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but I but I listen and all kind of different stuff. I listen to to things that are associated with football, business, politics, um, all different uh, different genres of things that I would read and listen to. Then I meditate, and 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 I'm just going to say this. Um, Meditation is probably one of the most important things I've ever started doing. And last year we were in Nevada. I was, I was, uh, we, we, we had a bunch of wildfires there in August. And so we had to leave Reno, Nevada and go to Palo Alto and Stanford. And we were there for a month. And so, um, you know, in one of my readings, I, 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 I listened to people talk about the mind and how important it was to be still. And, and so uh, I started researching it. And uh, so I went and sought out a guy that taught transcendental meditation. And just an amazing guy. He was 73 years old, this little skinny guy, bald head. He surfed every day. And I said, why don't you learn this stuff? And he goes, um, he, goes I was in, he goes, I was in Berkeley in the late 60s. And he goes, all the teenagers and the Beatles came to town. And all the te and they had just been with the Maharishi. And so and all the kids wanted to learn this meditation. But he taught that to me. And uh, so 20 minutes I, I meditate. And then I, I swing the golf club. They took this picture of me. And this was a great reminder for me because this is terrible for me. <laughs> it's absolutely terrible. But I swing the golf club for 10 minutes, and it kind of is the last thing I do, and it just dials me in for the day, thinking about all the things that I need, I need to do for the day. Okay, so that's just my morning, my morning uh, routine. I think as a leader, you need to be an avid reader. And so here's here's my top 10 or top 11. These are books that I absolutely love. And um, and they all have some type of great theme to them. Um, I read a book about five or six years ago named, named by, its title is Grit by Angela Duckworth. Amazing book, and it left a real, real impression on me on what it takes to be successful. And Grit is your passion and perseverance, okay? Um, the Compound Effect by Darren Hardy, amazing life-changing book. The Science of Hitting by Ted Williams. And for those of you that don't know who Ted Williams is, Ted Williams was the last hitter in baseball that hit 400. I think it was 1941. He hit 406. Okay? And he could have he could have ended the season. It was a double header at the, at the end of the season. And he was over 400. And the manager went to him and said, you know, you can sit this out and you'd be the, the first player to hit 400 in several decades. And he said no. And I think he went 5 for 7 in that double header. And he ended up hitting 406. But an amazing, amazing, great baseball player. But this guy has some really amazing thought processes that can affect everybody in business. And uh, I heard Warren Buffett talk about Ted Williams. And this poster is one of the most amazing posters that you can see. This is Ted Williams in the strike zone. So this is 66 baseballs and a strike zone. And Ted Williams had a theory of hitting. And his theory was this, is that the most important thing that you have to do to get a great hitter is get a good pitch to hit. Is get a good pitch to hit. And this chart is 66 baseballs in the strike zone. It's 11 balls down, 6 rows across. Now, you can't see this because it's not clear enough, but on each one of those baseballs is his batting average. Okay? And if you can see, there's 
three and a half baseballs right in the middle of the plate. And when that ball was right in the middle of the plate, he hit 400. Now, the orange ones are like 370. The yellow ones are like 320. Okay? And then you can see, you know, these, 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 the low outside pitches, they're like 260. This is the amazing thing, and, and this is where you can learn something from it. In 1941, he hit 406. That means that he rarely hit a baseball that was not red. And, and I say that because I, I talk to the kids all the time about this. Life is about taking advantage of when the odds are in your favor. And so you got to get a good pitch to hit. And when you get a good pitch to hit, boy, you got to nail it. And I think this is one of the most incredible analogies in life for whatever business you talk about. Warren Buffett talks about this. This is how he invests stocks. He's very conservative, but when he when he when he has the odds in his favor, he's putting his chips on the table because that's when you make the big gains. And so this poster means so much to me. And 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 our players, we talk about getting a good pitch to hit. Life is about percentages. It's like chess. When you're a great chess player, you're always thinking three and four moves ahead. And so that's what I love about that book, Science of Hitting. Uh, one thing is an amazing book, Moneyball. Moneyball is a great book by Michael Lewis because it's about baseball, but it's about thinking outside the box and doing things differently than they've always been done in that, in that business. So, uh, you know, it's about the Oakland A's, and it's about how they use analytics and statistics to choose their players. And it was never really done in baseball before. Now everybody does it. Everybody does it. And, and that's a great book. Mindset by Carol S. DeWay. Amazing book. Amazing book. Um, you know, the Walter Isaacson series on, uh, on, on Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, Albert Einstein. Unbelievable lives that you can learn so much from. The Culture Code by Daniel Coyle. Daniel Coyle says the most important quality of a culture is that people need to feel safe. You have to feel safe before you really start listening to how you, the strategies of how you're going to attack them. And it's the same thing on a football team. You know, our guys, number one, they have to feel like they're in a safe environment where they're valued. So important. System, systemology. You know, we do this in our sport. We have, we have systems for everything we do. We have systems for recruiting. We have systems for offense. We have systems for defense. We have systems for special teams. We have, we have systems for everything that we do. And it's important that you refine those systems. Okay? Becoming supernatural. This was my meditation deal here. And, and one of the great thoughts of that book is this. It's just really good, especially if you're in a leadership position, is that people's energy is where their focus is. I can look at my team and I can tell the guys that are engaged just by their body language. If they're bright eyed, if they're engaged, if they have energy, then I know they're, they're, they're dialed into what we're doing. It's so important. Okay? And then Snowballs, Warren Buffett, uh, one, a book, book on Warren Buffett, and, and I'm a big fan. He's one of my heroes. Choose your heroes wisely. 
really important. Any, you know, and I, and I spend a time on this because I think it's so important. We are in the greatest age ever of, of knowledge and learning. Anybody can be your mentor. They don't even have to be alive. Study them, research, read about them, and you can find out a lot from them. So I really take a lot of pride in having a growth mindset, and, and that was one of the books that I read, but it simply means this, that we are not finished products. You know, don't ever let anybody say you're not smart enough. You know, that you're not, you know, in our sport, you know, you're, you're not tall enough, you're not big enough, you're not fast enough. <clears throat> you can work to be better. And I've spent a lifetime, I'm the greatest example of that of all. I, I'm a better coach today than I was last week because I never stop working to get better. And as long as you have that mindset, there's really nothing you can't accomplish. You know, when I listen, when I read business books and I read about billionaires and you know, guys are billionaires, they fail so many times before they're successful. And that's what our practices are built on. Our practices are built on players learning from their failures. If you would watch us practice, um, we have a very specific way of practicing. I don't like anybody standing around. People don't learn from standing around. So we have split practices, uh, like our, our ones and threes practice first and our twos and fours practice because I want the twos to experience everything that the ones experienced. And they get to run the same amount of plays. And they make mistakes and they see themselves on film, and that's where they get better. That's where they learn. If you're really not, if you're not failing, you're really not giving yourself a chance to get better. So, really, really important. And, and, and I really believe this, and, and this really doesn't matter what your line of work or what your business is. What we do, is we prepare, we spend a lot of time studying film, studying the game plan, getting ready for competition, and then we go compete. We see where we're at. And then after the competition, we reflect on the mistakes that we made, and then we try to do it all over again. And we prepare again. I'm not going to make the same mistake I did yesterday, and I compete, and maybe I make that play today. And then I reflect what things do I got to get better at. That's life. That's life. You prepare, you compete, you reflect. Really, really important to understand that, because some people, people tell them they're not smart enough, they believe them. should motivate you to be better, better prepared, read a little bit more, study a little bit more, work a little bit harder. Okay? And so mindset, having a growth mindset is probably one of the most important qualities you can have. I'm, I'm, I'm way better than I used to be, and I'm, and I'm, I'm going to be better this fall, next fall, because I'm not going to stop learning. Not going to stop learning. Okay? I think this is really huge. Establish a clear mission statement. The emphasis on, is on clear. Okay? What is it? One of the things that I tell all of our coaches is make sure the players know exactly what their job is. A lot of times when people make mistakes, it's because the mission statement wasn't clear. So this is our mission statement. This is for a football team. By, with, and through 
respect, accountability, and hustle, Colorado State football will develop a family, a family in a brotherhood forged by grit, compelled by greatness, and committed to excellence. It's important that they understand the mission statement because they shouldn't have to come and ask you what they're supposed to do. They should be able to figure out what they're supposed to do from the mission statement. For, for us, we have three core values. These are non-negotiable things that everybody in our program has to do. Um, and, you know, I coached for about two decades, and I would have players come to me all the time. Coach, what do I need to do to be successful? Coach, how can I, how, I want to be great. What, what do I need to do? And so, I was, my son was, was in karate lessons, and I was taking him, and I was sitting there, and I'd sit there in the dojo, and I'd watch him do all these things. And I just noticed they had these three simple rules. And I said, you know something? There's a lot to that. And so I started thinking about what are the three most important things to be successful. And it really came down to three things. The number one thing that we wanted was be respectful. Now, what does that mean? For us, it means we want everybody in our program to be a gentleman. Treat people the way you want to be treated. And what I realize is this, is when everybody does that, players, coaches, trainers, everybody in the program, it's amazing how few problems you have. You just don't have many problems. If people are respectful of one another, the other thing about respect is this, your priorities are in line when you have humility, and your respect. Your priorities are mine. So that's the number one thing that we ask everybody in our program. You must be respectful. Now, I've gotten rid of people, I've gotten rid of players, I've gotten rid of coaches because they weren't respectful. When I first was at that, I had a player who was driving around on campus and he had a handicap tag. He was parking in handicap spots. And he wasn't handicapped, obviously. And we had a lady that worked in, in, in academics that was in a wheelchair. And I found out that this kid was, was parking in these handicap spots. I got rid of him. He, he's not on the team anymore. Because he broke our number one rule. Our number one rule. Okay, so we expect everybody to live by that. Accountability. Boy, this is a really tough word. Accountability. We want people that are 100% accountable for their actions. That's so easy to say and so hard to live by. What is it? to be 100% accountable for your, what does it look like? Well, I worked for Jim Moore. I told you I worked for Jim Moore, who was a Marine. He started every team meeting five minutes early. Every team meeting five minutes early in professional football. And he would just start. And, but what happened was is everybody knew that he was going to do that. Everybody was there sitting there ready for him to start. And that's the way you want to live your life. We want our players, our coaches, everybody to be ready for their opportunity. We want them to be the same way in class. Be there, sit down when the instructor starts, have your pad and pen ready to go. That shows respect. So, you know, and, and, I, and I've been really lucky over the years. I've met all these super successful people. And people that are ultra successful, they know 
It's the choices that they make that are going to determine their success. So that accountability is everything. It's everything. So we want our players to have that. You know, my grandpa had a saying, he said, you don't have to get ready if you stay ready. And it's really true. We want our guys to be completely prepared. And then hustle. Everybody knows what hustle is. You know, if you throw a basketball on the floor, somebody's going to dive to go get it. Hustle is very specific. Hustle's different than working hard. Hustle is outworking the other guy. And whatever your line of work is, you got to have a mentality where you're going to outwork the other person. We have to outwork the teams that are on our schedule. Our coaches, our players, our administrative people, we have to outwork. You have to have a sense of urgency in everything that you do. And that's my job. That's my job to make sure everybody has that. So those three things, respect, accountability, and hustle. And then this next point is really important. Forged by grit. What is grit? Grit is your passion and your perseverance. And this is the thing. Everybody, you've heard the 10,000 hour rule, mastery. It takes 10,000 hours to, to, to master something. You're playing a piano. Shooting archery, uh, you're, you're throwing a football, whatever the skill is, 10,000 hours is that magic number. There's a great story about the Beatles in the book Mastery where they really talk about the Beatles really became a great band. I think they went to Russia and they were they were playing in a brothel. And they played every single day of the week. But they did that for months. And they got so good, they got their 10,000 hours together as a band. And that's when they really became great. It's the same thing no matter what you're trying. You know, we, we, we run the airway. We throw the football. We love throwing the football. We found that it's about, our quarterback throws about 300 balls of practice. And so we figured it takes like 33 practices for to get 10,000 balls. And so, because we're trying to be great at throwing the football. So, what is grit? Grit is overcoming adversity. Grit is knowing that if you have a long-term goal, you never give up on it. And so any short-term setbacks are not going to deter you from your goal. And so that's perseverance. You're passive. It's like raising a kid. You're never going to give up on raising your kid. It doesn't matter how old he gets. It's the same thing. If, you, if your goal is to win a championship, you're going to keep working until you get that championship. And so the short-term setbacks don't keep you from working towards your goal. So how do you do that? You, 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 you can get more gritty. How do you get more gritty? You get more gritty by doing something hard. So we have eight weeks of winter training. That's all we do is we do stuff that are hard. We don't tell the guys what we're going to do. We have all these different crazy workouts that we do, military workouts, where they got to carry each other, firemen carry, all this crazy stuff that they've never done before. But what they realize is they have more in them than they thought. The other thing is they suffer together, and so they get closer as a team. They suffer, which is another talk all together. But, but, but as a leader, it's important you do hard things. Um, when, when, when COVID, you know, hit, I was trying to be super healthy, so I, 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 I was vegan for like 12 months. So I was trying to be healthy. Um, and I exercised. I, I probably exercised more during COVID than ever. Um, you know, I, I, I would do like 
crazy things like do a whole bunch of push-ups. And, and uh, um, I challenge my players, all that kind of stuff. I, I, I read another book, and, and one of the things that I still do it to this day, I take a cold shower every morning, except Sunday. Why do I do that? And, and uh, it was a military book I think I read. But I take a cold shower, and I think this is important for leaders. I take a cold shower every day, and I, and I did it after a loss a couple years ago, and I, and I said I was going to take a shower every day until we played that team again, and we could beat them. And, and, uh, but I take a cold shower every day to remind me of all the things that I have to do that day that I don't want. Is anybody, I know we have the instructor, has anybody in here ever had to fire anybody? Nobody? Okay, because you yes. <laughs> It's not fun. It really isn't fun. Or if you have to cut a player from the team, you know, those are things that you have to do as a leader. And I take a cold shower to remind myself, I know I have to do that today. I'm willing to do it. And I tell the players all the time, and I think it doesn't matter what your business is, if you're a CEO or a leader, you know, they say, oh, coach, you have to make all these tough decisions. It's really, it really must be hard to make all that. And, and I tell them it's really easy because every decision that I make, I do it for the team. I just ask myself, what's best? for the team. And so, you know, if cutting a player is best for the team, if getting rid of a coach is what's best for the team, it's an easy decision. I don't like doing it. I don't enjoy doing it. But it's 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 not hard. It really isn't. And and so, you know, and all those things, uh, you know, we, we forge, we're forged by grit, compelled by greatness. Everything you do, you want to be great at it. And we're committed to excellence. That's our mission statement. And so our players understand that. And that's something that we really, uh, really take a lot of pride in. Um, this is one of my favorite books. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit a bunch of of uh, leadership points on this. So this is a book called Legacy. It's written by James Kerr. And it's about, it, this is the leadership uh, structure of the New Zealand All Blacks. The New Zealand All Blacks is a rugby team. It's, it's one of the great rugby dynasties in all sports. And so this is a chapter by chapter um, structure. We read this with our leadership uh, team. So we have a leadership council. It's And on our team, we have 114 players. We have 10 different position groups. So we, 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 we would have our players vote for representatives from each position group. And then we meet with them for 30 minutes twice a week. We talk about a lot of things. We read books together. We talk about leadership. And this is this is something that we really take to heart. And so I want to talk about a couple of a couple of the thoughts that we have adopted as a team, as leaders. Um, the first one is we call it sweeper the sheds. And what that is, it's personal accountability. Nothing is too small for the leader to do. And so there's a story that they talk about. The All Blacks, they're like the New York Yankees of rugby. They're the greatest team. And um, um, they get a lot of publicity. And they talk about this, this, this big victory that they had. You know, and everybody in the country thought they were celebrating. And after this game, the captains, we're sweeping the shit. They're cleaning the locker room. They're doing the little things 
that make their environment really important. And this is our locker room at CSU. When I first was hired on December 7th, they introduced me, we got a press conference. I was walking through the locker room and I was meeting a lot of the players. And I was looking and, and, and I just kind of looked over their shoulders and I saw in the locker room there were towels on the floor. There was tape on the floor. There were shoes on the floor. There were pads on the floor. And I just made a mental note of that. And when the kids went home for Christmas break and they came back, I put them all in the JD locker room. So it's concrete on the floor, steel lockers. It's not nice. There's one shower. There's two spigots, I think, in the shower. For 114 guys, it's not real comfortable. But I did that because I said, the locker room being dirty, that was a sign of poor leadership. Your teammates are telling you they don't respect the leadership on the team. And so for eight weeks, they were in the JV locker room, and we talked about leadership, and we talked about the things that are important. For us, nobody cleans up after us. If we go into a cafeteria, we pick our plates up, we throw them in the garbage, we, we put trays away. We don't leave garbage on the table. We don't leave food on the table. If we take a bus trip, we get lunch boxes, we get Gatorade bottles. There's not one bottle or box on the bus when we leave. Because our leaders check. They walk up and down the aisles. They look, they make sure. Nobody cleans up after the Rams. We clean up after ourselves. And that is the leadership's responsibility. So this is super important. Because if we're not any good in here, we're not going to be any good on the field. For sure. Okay? So this is number one. There's nothing too small for the leader to do. Servant leadership is the greatest example. Okay? You know, this is when you're on top of the game, you change your game. And, and, uh, What's, what's, what's important about that? You know, people get really successful and you can't ever stay the same. You can't ever stay the same. Um, you got to always change it up, add something new, and, and, and really improve your standing. Pull on my notes here. This is really interesting. And, and and uh, these are three points, and they're not on the screen, but I'm going to read it to you. This is uh, Alexander Sherbaroff wrote this military manual, okay? And there's three points that were really important. And, and uh, the first one is his drop, okay? Playing a fast-paced game for us, we love to play at a, at a hyper pace because you create opportunities when you do that on offense. The second point is making quick decisions that disorient the op opposition. If you ever watched us practice, we give our quarterback a lot of leeway to make decisions and to change plays. And if you play at a high pace, you get people disoriented, you create opportunities to make something happen. And then, the third one is acting aggressively to seize a competitive advantage. And that goes back to the very first slide I showed you with Ted Williams. So, you know, we want to play fast. We want to dis disorient the opponent. And then when they get out of position, man, we want to stay big. And for us, I can get into a whole football discussion. But for us, there's an old saying, and actually it's amazing that Lou Holtz was the one that said it, and Lou Holtz was known for being pretty conservative offensively, but he said this, and it's the same philosophy I have in life. Never take six yards over six points. What does that mean? Never be scared and conservative to drop the ball down 
When you got a guy open in the end zone, and you can score a touchdown, it's the same way in business. You, you listen to Warren Buffett talk, it's the same thing that he says. Man, we can go big, go big. And so those, those things are really, really, really important. Um, play with a purpose. This is, this is one of our kids, and this is, this is his, uh, his why picture, right, Coach? This is why picture. So, so we started this when I was with Coach at Arizona State. And, and uh, so every player has a picture of, of who helped him get to college. You always play better when you play for somebody else. So these are, this is an example of that. This is Tori Hart. This is his picture in his locker, and that's his family. But play with a purpose. We have a purpose for everything we do. We spend more time thinking about what we're going to do before we do it. And I think this is a great quote. You know, you got to think big. Martin Luther King had a saying, he said, I have a dream. Yeah, I have a dream speech, right? He didn't have, I have a plan speech. He had, his speech was, I have a dream. And he made people see that. Really, really important. And if you hire people that believe and think the way you do, boy, there's some amazing things that you, you can accomplish. You know, play with a purpose. Ask why we do the things that we do. You know, number four is pass the ball. Leaders create leaders. So we have older players that are showing their younger players how to do things properly. And they create younger leaders. So important. As as senior management as the coach, we want to transfer the leadership from the coaches to the players. The best organizations are led from the inside and out. And so we empower our leadership to act on things that they need to act on. And so our leaders, we talk to our leaders, we talk to our council, and then they go in the locker room, and then they make the other players really understand what needs to be done. Okay? Really, really important. Leaders are definitely teachers. One of my favorite books, and I didn't list it, was by Bill Walsh. And, his, and the book is entitled, The Score Takes Care of Itself. But he says, our, he says, leaders are teachers. Our job is to lead people through uncertainty and confusion and into self-possession. Sometimes it only takes one encounter with one teacher to change a life and many lives after that. Okay, this is my favorite chapter. Okay, and it's called The Spearhead. Coach Cassidy didn't want me to say this word, but, but in every organization, I, I think we're all adults here. The, the, the name of the chapter is really no dickheads. Excuse my language, okay? And sometimes just words just create the image and, and make everybody understand. This is the spearhead. So we all know this is a flock of geese flying flying south, maybe. Um, but something really symbolic about this, you know, um, they carve a V across the sky. One bird leads, the other follows. It's an endless, synchronized support system, much like a peloton in professional cycling. Okay? Scientists say it's 70% more efficient for birds to fly this way. Really important. If a bird falls out of the formation, he's got to fight the wind on his own. He doesn't have any help. It's much like a team. We, our players, we talk all the time, is that in life, when are you going to get 100 guys and have your back? There's not very many places.
places in life you get that. But you have to sacrifice something to be part of a team. So you've got to give up part of yourself. This is an incredible metaphor for that. If one bird falls behind, the others wait and let them catch up. And so this is one of my favorite symbols for a team because when we're first starting out, we're all over the place. As we move along, we start to fly in formation. We start to do things properly. We start to be on the same page. And I love this. I love this symbolism. And we'll put it up every Friday night when we go play games to remind guys of what they should be. There's an old Arab proverb, and I think it really makes sense for every organization. It's better to have a thousand enemies outside the tent than one enemy inside the tent. And when you think about it, it's the perfect example for a team. When we're all working together, we're all respectful of one another, everybody knows their job, everybody's doing what they're supposed to do, boy, we can function at a high level. But if there's one guy that's selfish, that has his own idea, he can really screw up the culture for everybody else. And we don't function as well. There's another, there's another uh, Maui saying, um, a little water seeping through a small hole may swamp the canoe. And I think we all know what that is. It's just that one person that doesn't buy in, that has his own agenda, that's always looking to do something opposite of what we're trying to accomplish as your team. The one bad actor can really take away. And that's where, you know, you, 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 many times, addition by subtraction, you eliminate that person from the scenario and everybody else starts to thrive. And sometimes you have to do that as a leader. I love this chapter, and I think it has so many great symbols for, for us, for our team, okay? Um, you know, embrace expectations. Aim for the highest cloud. I think it's really important as a leader um, that you learn great stories. Stories really allow everybody to understand what your purpose is, okay? Um, you know, what's your meaning of life? Um, mental metaphors for your organization. I think it's a great, great advantage as a leader to be a good storyteller. Really, really important. You know, for us, preparation is everything. Practice is everything. We put everything into practice. And it's really important that we practice under pressure. You know, today we had, we were working triple option because we play Air Force. Uh, we, 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 we worked red zone. We worked two minute with the clock running down, one timeout, we need to touch down, we got 70 yards to go. We work in those pressure situations all the time because when we get to the game, it should be easy. Okay, so it's important we learn to focus under chaos, and we can we can teach interactive uh, decision making in the heat of battle. So so important. Um, this is huge. This is huge, and this is called keep a blue head. Um, you know, in pressure situations, you have to stay calm, obviously, and. Uh, you know, when, when the heat gets turned up, the pressure starts rising, things start turning red, and you can lose control, okay? And as leadership, you have to keep a blue head. You have to make wise decisions and be under control. How many do you get time? Okay. Um, and how do you do that? You got to use maps, mantras. You got to have... Yeah, you got to have things that bring you back to center. Okay? Really, really important that you're able to do that. Um, and I've been with some, 
I've been with some amazing competitors, players. I mean, I had guys that looked like they were completely out of control and they could snap right back and completely focus on what they're supposed to do. And that's really uh, that's really a sign of a very good leader. Okay. Um, I'm working through this. Uh, this is huge. And it's so important as a leader. Um, one of the most valuable things, you know, my first year as a head coach, there were so many different things going on. There was so much transition. The last team, there were a lot of players who were worried about the last coach. Kids that weren't sure if they wanted to be there. All this stuff. You know, and I had learned all these things from all these these coaches, and I thought I was supposed to do this, and I thought I was supposed to do that. And I read a great book by Bill Parcells, who's one of the most incredible leaders. Um, and basically, after his first year with the New York Giants, it was unsuccessful. And he just said, screw it. I'm going to do things the way I want to do them. I'm going to do them my way. And if it doesn't work, then it's on me. And I learned so much from reading that, and, and I basically did the same thing. You have to speak from your soul when you talk to your team. If they think you're faking it, they will see right through you. I don't like to talk to my team very much, but when I do talk to them, boy, it means something from me. So make sure that you are your authentic self. There's a great saying, and I'm going to screw it up, but I think it was Coltrane or one of those great jazz musicians, and he said, it took me a long time to play before I started playing like myself, instead of copying other musicians. And I think you've got to find that as a leader, so important. Be genuine. You know, there's a great definition of integrity, and integrity doesn't necessarily mean good. It really means true. You know, if a person's a bad person and they show you their true self, they have integrity, it's just not good. <laughs> um, but it's important, I think, the people you work with. Know who you are. That's so important. And, you know, I heard an explanation of integrity. They said it's like gravity. And so, be who you are. Be who you say you are. And I think that goes a long way. Um, I think this is really important. Sacrifice. Champions do extra. I love this. There's no crowds lining the extra mile. You know, what you have to do to be great, there's no crowds there. Nobody's going to see it. But you have to do it to make sure that you're prepared for what you have to do. You know, find something you would give your life for and do it. Because you really are, whatever your business is, you really are giving your time and your life to something. Um, every meeting you're in, you know, every extra thing you have to study, um, really, really important. You know, there's a saying at the end of this chapter that says, don't die like an octopus, die like a hammerhead shark. And whatever you do, boy, you want to pour your life, pour yourself into it. There's another great saying, and I got this from Hal Mummy, who's my quarterback coach's dad, but and this, this comes from an Alamo captain in Texas. One crowded hour of glorious life is worth an age without a name. There's so much truth to that. Um, find something that totally fulfills you, and you'll give your best to it. That's for sure. Um, you know, invent a language. Whatever your organization is, you have to have a language that means something to the people in that organization. 
Okay? For us, we have things that mean something to us. Respect, accountability, hustle, be a gentleman. Manners matter. What's happening to manners in our world? Ram grit. That's, that's our thing. For us, we want to make the jersey better than what we got. That means, you know, they've been playing football since 1893, right? 1893 here in Colorado State. So we're not the first people that play football here. They've been playing football here for over 100 years. You know, there was somebody in that number number 12 jersey before you were there. But you want to make the jersey better than when you were given it. That's something that's important to us. There's a rent that must be paid every day. That's our hard work. Okay? Be five minutes early. You don't have to get ready if you stay ready. Empty your tank, leave it all in the field. It's not the jersey, it's the man in the jersey. Follow the spearhead. It's an honor to lead. It's a privilege to lead. Okay? Just some things that mean a lot to us. I love this. No free lunch. Okay? There's no free lunch for any of us. And, uh, and that's really important. Ritualize to actualize. Um, this is something that means something important to us. It's our thing. Okay? It says today, today we play the Ramway. What does that mean? We play with pride. We play with toughness. We play with togetherness. We tap in. This is what when we go to work. Okay? I, I always remember when I was a kid, I used to watch uh, the Roadrunner. Okay? And the Coyote. And there's a scene where they're walking with their lunch boxes. And then they punch in. And then and the Coyote chases them all day. And then when they leave, they punch out again. This is tapping in. We're going to work. Okay? And so we tap in every single time we go on the practice field. Um, and that's something that we do. It doesn't have to mean anything to anybody else, but it means something to us. Okay? Um, you know, we want to be build relationships and we want our players to be good ancestors. What does that mean? Our leaders are planting trees that they'll never see. So when our captains and our leaders give of themselves, show a great example, play through pain and injury, um, give all of themselves, and they're selfless, they're planting trees that they'll never see. There's some freshman looking at the senior and, and saying, that's how it's supposed to be done. And so we talk about that all the time. Um, What's your, what you leave behind is not engraved on the wall or on a headstone. It's in the lives of the people that you work with. So important. Muhammad Ali said this. He said, service to others is the rent you pay for your room on, on earth. It's a great, great saying. And so it's a great thing to live by. But that's what we want our players to do. John Wooden said this to great UCLA coach, be more concerned with your character than your reputation because your character is what you really are. While your reputation is merely what others think of you. I always cared more about what my players thought of me than what you guys think of me. Or anybody outside our team. I don't really care what other people think. And I don't worry. My Bible says don't worry. So I don't worry. I really don't worry about anything, to be honest with you. Um, and then this last thing uh, is so important. is write your own legacy. And so we have a book, and Colton's putting it together. This is the very first team, 1893, that played at Colorado State. And this was their uniforms. They don't even have numbers. They have ribbons. Ribbons. Okay? So this first jersey that anybody's ever lived, uh, ever wore here at this university, you know,
know, and, and you know, and then 1900 they had jerseys, and then 1905, 1912, and all these players wore jerseys. And in this book, it goes all the way up to 2022. And the rest of the pages of the book are blank. And the rest of the pages are filled by our players today. This is their time. What are you going to do with your opportunity? And how are you going to honor all these guys that have played before you? <clears throat> and that's really, really, really important. Um, and so that's what we challenge our players and our coaches. And so um, this is actually the last slide. I don't know what else is on here. Um, did we want to do questions? Or... Yeah, that's good. 